St. Francis College Forum on Migration is our new educational center dedicated to facilitating the dialogue between various nonprofit organizations, um, academic research, and political institutions, and advocacy of immigrants' rights. Among other topics, uh, St. Francis College Forum on Migration uh, deals with uh, the trends of global migration, racialization, and criminalization of undocumented immigrants, and the adjustment of newly arrived immigrants in their receiving countries. We host a series of lectures and public events to analyze the most current uh, immigration policies and the most recent research in the field. Um, as a matter of fact, our next uh, event is scheduled for uh, Wednesday, May 1st. At 2 o'clock, we will host a presentation of um, Debbie Almontasar's uh, book, Leading While Muslim. St. Francis College Forum on Migration um, perpetuates the Franciscan tradition and it is founded on the values of respect, compassion, benevolence, and understanding. Um, therefore, our task is uh, to broaden our students' horizons so um, that our students, while applying their critical analytical skills, would approach immigration issues with open hearts and minds, with understanding and compassion. Today, we bring together our civil activists, legal experts, and uh, academic scholars who will shed light on the um, history of international labor movement and its economic and social effects, um, legal uh, aspects of contemporary migration, and the most current immigration policies. Our speakers will share their knowledge and expertise for better understanding of these timely topics, while our students and our guests will have a chance to ask them questions and to engage in um, our immigration debate and make their voices heard. Well, um, and now um, I'm truly honored to present the president of St. Francis College, Miguel Martinez Sáenz, who is an immigrant himself and whose leadership and initiatives actually resulted in the establishment of our new academic center, educational center. Thank you so much. A couple things before I make some brief, very brief remarks is to thank uh, Professor Lemmick, Professor Kaplan, um, also uh, Reza Fakari for, for pushing this issue. There are a number of things that we can we can talk about. Um, there's also a contributing faculty, it's the Professor Horowitz is here, who's been very supportive of this initiative, among other things. And so Professor Lancaster, who's our VP academic. So a lot of thanks to go around. Uh, these things don't happen if you don't have a whole lot of folks uh, doing some doing some work. So um, I think that that's important. Just to orient us, um, we should start always. I think some some of you know I, I like to start to to frame the conversation with some piece of poetry. I think it's kind of important for us to put ourselves in a good space. So I too sing America. You see, I am the doctor brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh, eat well, and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see just how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too 
sing a miracle. So for the young people, that's nice to use. And I think that piece is apropos for what we're doing. I also think storytelling is important. I mean, the arts are critically important as we think about a land founded by immigrants where immigrants has become a bad word. We need to really reflect on what that might mean, right? I mean, just think about that for a second, especially for the young folks, right? Land founded by immigrants, and now immigrant is a bad word. Call someone an immigrant, right? It's, it's problematic. How does, how does that emerge? in a nation as young as ours, and I think especially for the young folks, we have an opportunity to make some adjustments to the way we think about that. Language is very, very, very important. And the way we think about the immigrant experience is critically important. I think stories are also important. And we need to make sure that we understand that there's a complexity to the ways that people negotiate a new space. You know, my own experience, and I tell you very quickly, I've been asked a number of times in different institutional settings to come talk about uh, English as a second language. And while that's true, I also grew up in a very homogenous community in Miami, Florida. So to give you a feel, and somebody asked me one day in a, in a, in a conversation with students, said, well, how did it feel to be the only one that was like you in a space? And I said, I didn't have that problem because in fact, our schooling in Miami we weren't the only ones. In fact, we were the dominant ones. The others were the only ones. I mean, to give you a sense, in elementary school, um, K through eight, we probably had, I would say, maybe 20 American families in the space. So our interactions were actually very, very different from a lot of folks. And that's because there was a mass migration. My family's from Cuba, mass migration. So when a million people leave together, they form communities together. And that's been a very, very big different experience. So I first came to understand difference, and this might seem weird, especially to young people, when I went to college, because my interaction with other folks was non-existent. Everything I did was Cuban. Everything I ate was Cuban. So when I went to Tallahassee, I'll just tell you the silliness of stories, right? I went into this place called Jim and Milton, asked for some rice and beans, and the woman said, boy, we don't have rice here. I said, okay. I said, what do you have? And she said, we got baked beans, coleslaw, and Texas toast. And I said, well, I'll take the baked beans with a side of rice. <laughs> and she said, once again, boy, we don't have rice here. And I'm thinking to myself, looking at my buddy, thinking, what in the world? A restaurant without rice? What kind of people are these? <laughs> Turned out that Jimmy Mills didn't have rice. And uh, I will say that I got used to eating some Texas toast um, because it was all you can eat chicken for $4.95. So, a young man can do a lot of damage on chicken. And so I kept back going to have my server call me boy more often than not, but it was fine. I got my 495 chicken, so I got my lunch and dinner. But again, that was the first kind of, I mean, it sounds naive, but it was the first kind of experience to begin to realize what culture was. And I think sometimes we think that all the immigrant experiences are similar, they're not. And right? so moving into those spaces, right, all of a sudden you come to realize that your cultural norms, right, in fact, in some cases are problematic, right? In some cases, the way people are receiving you is really dictated by the manner in which you come at people, right? So for instance, personal space, right? People, our personal space is very, very different. Just to give you a sense, when I started teaching, my wife said, don't touch the students. And I said, touch the students, she's like, you touch everybody. <laughs> so, and that's the thing that you, right, our cultural norm is if I'm standing away from you, I'm pushing you away, right? So I gotta be close. And when we talk to people, we put our hands on people, we're sitting there, it doesn't matter who it is, you stand, you're sitting at the dinner table, you might be touching somebody's hand as you're telling them a story. I had to unlearn that. But you gotta unlearn. And so I think that's one of the complexities that we begin to understand that you have to actually unlearn, right? I mean, you can think about the boys and the soul of black folk when he talks about double consciousness, but that's what ends up happening in the immigrant experience. It happens differently, right? There's a complexity to the way that happens. You think about the Chicano experience. I mean, it's a very complex experience. And you think about immigrants that are first generation whose parents sometimes didn't want to speak the language because they wanted to assimilate. So there are a lot of first-generation folks 
whose parents in fact deprived them of their culture simply because the environment in which they resided was hostile. And so they were doing that to protect their children. I mean, think about that. They were doing that to protect their children. I think it was misguided. And we've got families, and I've interacted with families that, that have that same experience, right? But that's critically important for us to begin to understand how, that, how, do, you, how do you think about that? How do you think a young person, right, in a space like that, where they recognize that they're neither this nor that, right? Because that's the move right there. You're neither this nor that. You know, one of the things I think the Puerto Ricans in New York have done really well is to call themselves Puerto Rican, right? Why is that? I would tell you something like this. I don't know, are there Puerto Ricans here, New Ricans here? Okay, so, so don't disagree with what I say, so. <laughs> but this is one of the reasons they do that. They adapt to New Rican because what you know is that there's a cultural element that now has evolved, and that's cool. But there's also a language distinction. So for those of you who aren't or haven't been to the island, what you realize there is there are two very different cultures. Very, very different cultures. There's some similarities, but there's some differences. And so there's a sense in which your, your cultural identity, right, you're, 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 you're reaching for something. But I imagine that there's some New Ricans that go to Puerto Rico and, and they feel out of sorts. Because it's not really their space. So what they did was, right, begin to claim a space, claim a culture of their own. So you know some slam poetry, right? You see that spirit. And I think that's critically important for us to begin to, to wrestle with how it is that young people, especially, I'm always thinking about young people. Because imagine just the children, they're trying to figure out, I'm not like my parents, because I can't speak the language. And a lot of times I always tell people, especially parents of, when I talk to them, I say, think about what your kids are doing. You're talking a language that they don't understand because you're not teaching them. What is that? How does that make them feel? And then they're going into a space where they're telling them, no, 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 you're one of those people. And they're like, no, actually, I'm not because I can't hang out in that space. And you're like, well, you can't hang out in our space either. How do you deal with that? So as you have the conversations today, which I know are going to be powerful, you're going to listen to some things, I think I, want, I just want to frame one piece, which is there's a moral... There are a series of moral issues that we need to attend to. And there's no question about that, but there's also a series of political issues, and we can't be naive about that. And I think one of the things that's happening in the kind of immigration debate, and it's a big, complex debate, is that we're kind of entangling the two. There are real political realities. We, we live in nation states. This is real. And you've got to figure out how to negotiate the politics and I don't mean the politics in the kind of rhetoric sense that you see on MSNBC or Fox News. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the political reality of how do you, how do you move somebody from refugee status into citizenship. That's not as straightforward as people like to think. It's complex. That doesn't mean it's an excuse. I'm simply saying that's one facet. Somebody's going to give a talk today. I'm not going to be able to be here, but I'd, I'd like to get a summary on that. It says immigration, a simple fix. I mean, I'm curious to see what the simple fix is. Because I think this is complex. I mean, I don't see the simple fix, but maybe somebody's got this thing figured out. But there's also a moral issue, and here's where I want to push at, because I think this is a critical piece. And, and I'm going to use a parable. So, Professor Lemming did my introduction for Franciscan, so I can skip all that part. Um, but this is a parable. It's a parable of the Good Samaritan. And I think for those of you who don't know that parable, got to take a look at it. But what happens in that space is critically important. Because what you see is a person that's hurt on the side of a road. What you begin to understand is that that's a fact. That person is in fact hurt. Did you have a priest come by? The priest recognizes that that person is hurt. And the priest walks home. You have a Levite walk by, which is just to give you a sense, it's a high standing figure in society. Right? High standing. Walks by. And then you have a Samaritan who's considered 
I'm going to put it in scare quotes, the immigrant, right? The pariah of the society. That's what you've got. you got somebody on the margins. I mean, the reason Christ tells the story the way he tells it is because it's critically important for us to understand. That's why it's the Samaritan. But the Samaritan does what? The Samaritan stops. Helps the man. Takes the man to the end. Tends to his wounds. Gives the innkeeper enough money. Says, take care of this man until he's better. He can be on his own. The other is the one who does that. And although Christ doesn't push us to think this way, I think part of the reason we see this is because the other has experienced, right, the rejection, understands the pain. But there's something fundamental that's done there, too, that the Samaritan asks a question that's, I think, critically important. And the Samaritan says, if I don't stop to help this man, what's going to happen to him? Whereas following Martin Luther King in a speech he gave in April 3, 1968, the priest and Levite asked a fundamentally different question, which is, if I stop to help this man, what might happen to me? And that's a critically important gesture. And I think as I move to a close, I want you to understand that language matters. It matters. And when we use immigrant pejoratively, negatively, it matters. And it matters to people here, but it also matters to us because it shapes our imagination. When we talk about them as opposed to us, it matters. When we say it's their problem, it matters. When we think about them as our problem, it changes the way we orient into the space. The immigration challenge that we are facing is our issue. It is not their issue. The fact that we have families being separated and we have innocent children. I always like to focus on the children. Innocent children who are being exposed to trauma every single day. And again, I don't think there's an easy fix, but we need to at least reflect on the fact that that is inappropriate to have children exposed to trauma. It is a moral question. And this is, for, for me, one of the great issues for the young people to wrestle with there, I think, Two fundamental issues that I like to push on, and I'm going to celebrate one of the things that we do here. And there's going to be some issues because it tried to the detention centers that we're seeing, but it's our post prison program that is recognizing that we've got to embrace some folks and show them some love. And I think with the immigration situation, we need to we need to learn how to love better. This is a critical kind of move, and as these detention centers now become profit centers. Where all we're seeing is the next step in the prison industrial complex. It's just the next step in trying to cash in on detainment, on the punishment paradigm. So I urge you as you reflect, especially young people, on what's being said today, this is real. These are real people's lives. These are real children. This is not an abstract concept. This is our issue. And so I urge you to take a moment just to think about it. And then I urge you as you engage with folks that are coming from abroad, that you don't make judgments. I urge you to engage them in conversation, learn a little bit about them, so you can begin to understand that story. Because all those stories are very, very different. And our curiosity to understand people's stories is absolutely critical if we're gonna address an issue of immigration. I thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna shift gears and introduce um, Richard uh, Sizleski. He's working with um, Catholic uh, Charities, he's the VP of Mission, he works with, um, uh, he's a director, of, you, can you give me that, that round of, I know Razor gave me the notes, but I'm, uh, but here's what I wanna say is the Catholic Church and Bishop DiMaggio, who I'm sure Richard will say something about, is unequivocal in his commitment to immigration, in, in unequivocal, and I was in a space with him, say this last story, I was in a space with him, and it was a space that was not particularly friendly, to what's going on today. And it was a group, I don't know, it would have been four or 500 people. And the irony is they were all immigrants. Right? They came from a line of immigrants. And I give the bishop a lot of credit. I've been here, but I'm looking at flood. I've been here a few months only, I think. For, and I give him credit, because he stood up in that room and he laid out the moral issues and he got a very lukewarm reception, and they were all Catholics. I just want to be clear about that. Every single person in that room was a Catholic. 
and he got a very lukewarm reception. But I celebrate him because it's courage when you do it in that space, when you don't placate the space. It's courage, and he has been showing leadership and courage. And so I appreciate his leadership on this front. It's absolutely critical. So Richard, give it a Bishop DeMars, who really is an inspiration for me. I've been in my entire adult life, let's say out of college. Where did I go after college? I went to Colombia and I worked in something called Base Communities. We were looking at a lot of human rights issues. And uh, I did that for a number of years down in Colombia. I speak Spanish. That doesn't show on my face, I know. But, uh, you know, for me, it entered into a whole different world to see people and the issues that they encountered, to reflect on those issues in light of their faith and try to come up with solutions. The Sija Jack. I have a, a niece. She went to a very good college. All of a sudden, she said, Richard, do you know the Sija Jack hermeneutic? And I thought, oh my god, I, I, I certainly didn't know those words in college. But, uh, you know, people thinking about these kinds of issues are very interesting, you know? For me, when I look at the Diocese of Brooklyn, it's a very interesting place. First and foremost, it's we're a church of immigrants. And very much as to, that he would speak, I think there's a real problem that there's a real amnesia at times from where we come from. So to be honest, my name is Richard Slyzeski. I say that, but uh, thanks to my friends in, in Greenpoint and a few other places, Masbeth, a few others, they say, oh, that can't be how it was originally. No, it was Slyzeski. And there had to be a C, and there, there should have been a W, and, and it's true. But much to the point that I think they said, you know, that name is kind of difficult. Let's simplify it. Slyzeski happened a lot, right? And usually that wasn't them. Usually it's when they came across, they said, what's Slyzeski? No, let's take out a C and let's take out a Z and let's just put it back together again. And that was an experience for a lot of people, right? And you wonder why they decided to kind of, well, let's downplay this ethnicity thing, you know. But the reality for me is my grandparents on my father's side came from Poland. My grandparents on my mother's side came from Denmark. Now, the US is a very interesting place. Where do you get people from Poland and Denmark together? That doesn't happen a lot. But it did. And I will say, you know, in terms of language, yeah, I actually speak Danish. And I'll call it kitchen Danish, because basically it was my grandmother, uh, you know, who I hung out in the kitchen. Anything in the kitchen, I can tell you what, it's, what it is in Danish. I can tell you that. <laughs> Food, I'm really good at. But you know, that's all part of something to be celebrated in terms of our immigrant roots, right? Well, what's very important to think about in this place, in this very special place that we are, is the immense diversity of immigrants in Queens. I think they say it's the most diverse place in the whole country, right? You know, it's just all these different languages, different things. And to me, it's something to be celebrated. When, uh, I, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not originally from New York. But I can tell you when I have people visiting, I love to take them on the seven train. And we can be at one point over on Roosevelt Avenue, you know, in, among Southeast Asians. And we could be another part of Woodside, and all of a sudden we're with Filipinos. Uh, and I know all of, I like to pick up restaurants in different places. And my favorite right now is uh, an Uzbekistani place, uh, which was a lot of Jewish people came from Uzbekistan, you know, after things happened, you know. Uh, great restaurants. And most of my barbers are from Uzbekistan, right? You know, that is just how it goes. But all of those things, I think are, are a wonderful thing to be celebrated. But it certainly comes with a host of problems. And I think it's how, and I appreciate you say, as we frame the issue, it's so important how we frame this issue. He said that it's our problem. I just, why I had to have this is because when I'm quoting someone, I have to. Pope Francis wrote on the World Day of Migrants and Refugees. He said this. We ourselves need to see and then enable others to see that migrants and refugees do not only represent 
problems to be solved, but our brothers and sisters to be welcomed, respected, and loved. That's a tremendous thing. When all of a sudden I take a look at someone not as a problem to be solved, but as my brother or my sister who needs to be respected and loved, that changes the whole way that we approach things. Catholic Charities, I've worked there for 18 years now. My, my first assignments, I did a lot of community work. We were trying to get affordability in Williamsburg, can you imagine? We did get some. Uh, it was organizing. There were so many groups through our child care centers, through our senior centers, all people who lived in that community, by the way, and we knew that the changes and the towers were coming and we had wanted to get a piece of affordability in there and we worked together. I would say, if you looked at who were the people in the senior centers, who were the people in the child care centers, the senior centers, got all of these things, immigrants, every single one. But it's important that we had places to gather people and help them negotiate life negotiate and have some hope and, and to look towards the future. After that, they sent me, uh, as it happens in Catholic Charities, you know, I got a master in social work, you know, and as you know, I speak Spanish, and so all of a sudden they needed a director of a house for undocumented immigrants with AIDS. And they looked around and they said, Richard, and they put me out now. I can tell you, my very first experience, you know, every Tuesday they had some kind of educational thing. So I'm sitting in the room and they have someone talking about the newest co cocktail of drugs, you know, to help with the situation. And I'm seeing everyone's head nod and also I look around and I realize, you know, I'm the director of this place and I know less than anyone in this room. You know, it really was astounding. But fortunately, we all have to learn, right? That's part of what we do, you know? We learn and we, and we move forward. But I can tell you my best education with that group. It was a house that had 27 bedrooms. It used to be a convent. But what it did was it helped people who were coming from horrific situations. Listening to their stories was so important. 27 rooms, I would say, from 20 different countries. But to listen to their stories, to see them as human beings, not just problems to be solved. And then to support them so that they could move forward. And something I realized, their dreams were not so different than my grandparents. My grandfather, who worked in a paper mill, Never, my grandfather who never really mastered English, I can tell you that. You know, their dreams weren't so different. They wanted something for their lives. They came here with hope. And so our, our job really was to walk with them, to support them and find ways to help them. And it opened my eyes to a whole reality of Yes, the complexity of the immigration question, when, when all of a sudden, I know you're going to hear from as far as, you know, uh, immigration law and things, is very complicated, I, I agree, you know, and many of them had to go through, many of them had to sign these infamous letters saying, yes, I am here, and I am undocumented. Well, we're in a political climate right now that's very dangerous for them but they had to sign those things in order to get benefits so that they could help with their AIDS. Tough situation. So a lot of these things, as, as I look at this, you know, we're a church of immigrants that goes back, started in 1853, I looked at that. Bishop DiMarzio, I have seen him, and it's true, you know. When he comes into a room and he talks about the immigrant has rights, they are our brothers and sisters. He means it. And it, has, it should have consequences, right? On how we approach things. And, uh, and it's a challenge on how we do it, you know? 
sometimes you're, you, you, come, you become surprised how we don't necessarily th see things, you know, it comes out in a lot of ways. So I encourage you with this day, I think there's a lot to learn, I'm looking forward to it myself. But as we go forward, I, I just wanted to quote another thing here, because I think it's important. Pope Francis at the same gathering said, the reality of migration, given its new dimensions in our age of globalization, needs to be approached and managed in a new, equitable, and effective manner. More than anything, this call for international cooperation and a spirit of profound solidarity and compassion. Cooperation at different levels is critical including the broad adaptation of policies and rules aimed at protecting and promoting the human person. Amen. I think they're very powerful words. And it's something of a challenge to see today, but it's certainly something that can't be accomplished through one group, many groups. One of my great privileges, I'm director, the one title was director of Campaign for Catholic Human, uh, Catholic Campaign for Human Development. We support small grassroots groups who are trying to affect change. And I'm proud to say we have about five different groups that work on immigrant rights, immigrant worker rights, uh, throughout Brooklyn and Queens. And uh, there's, there's a, a large network of people who are really trying to change the effects for immigrants because there is a lot of exploitation happening even now in the city. So I, I really do look forward to our time together and uh, I'm glad that you came today. Thank you.